Every ego at its core is psychotic. There's a story that proves that, <clears throat> a famous story in psychiatric circles. There's a man in, a, uh, in an insane asylum because he believes he's a grain of chicken feet, whatever, a grain of rice, wheat, I'm not sure what it is in the chicken feet, but he's a grain. And of course his terror is that he's going to be eaten by a chicken. So he's locked up for many years. Finally the psychiatrist convinced him he's not a chicken. It's time to leave. They Okay, I'm not a chicken, I can go. He gets to the door of the asylum and he starts shaking and hesitating. He runs back in and they say, what, what's the matter? You don't believe you're a chicken anymore. And he says, no, no, of course I don't. But what if I say a chicken out there and he doesn't know that I've stopped believing that? <laughs> That's actually the same fear that stops us all from reaching enlightenment. If you think about it. I know I'm enlightened, but what if they don't know it? What if they treat me like I'm just an idiot? Do I become that? What if they say I'm a fool for believing that? You see, the power of the big other, as Jacques Lacan put it, the other with a capital O, not the little others so much, but the projection that there's some truth that's held by the collective other, which is maintaining the norms of society. So if we psychoanalyze not the conscious mind and not the unconscious fantasies, but the sensor itself, we'll find that there are two complexes that exist side by side in the sensor, and they're completely contradictory. One is that of solipsism. The ego doesn't believe that there really is anyone else, or at least that all the rest are, are, are robots, or they don't matter. And when that part breaks through into the conscious mind, then people can become psychopathic. They can commit crimes, murder, rape, whatever, because the other doesn't matter. They don't count. They're not real. So you can run over anybody and not, not care. And yet, then at the other side of it is the belief in the big other to which the ego grovels and submits and it cannot oppose. And so it's held in a state of helplessness. It doesn't care about the actual others in the world, but it cares about the big other. And it's this double complex that is the actual inverse of the liberated state in which we do recognize indeed there are many, many others. There's billions of human beings and many non-human others in the world. But there is no other with a capital O. Because there is God and God is one without a second, without an other. And so when the enlightened being sees human others, he or she sees only the self. And therefore there cannot be a control by that otherness that would determine our behavior and cause us to fear. So you know in seminar one we teach that there's these three boxes we have to go through, right? First the zombie box where you have to wake up out of denial. Pretty much everybody has done that. And then there are the S factor box, right? The four S factors. You've got to get over your fear of solitude, your fear of being insignificant, your, your issues around sexuality and your relationship to society. You break through that, and lo and behold, then you have to face the tin ho, right? The tin ho is not a restaurant. This is something that can eat you up. And on one side is the transcendence, individuation, and nothingness, right? And we fear transcendence because we know transcendence will lead to nothingness. And we fear individuation because we know individuation will lead to transcendence, which will lead to nothingness. And the loss of any sense of existing as a separate entity. And so then on the other side is this, the big other, that holds us in place. Because that other determines our understanding of ourselves. We take it from outside. 
we don't have an internal knowledge of who we are. And so the self-image comes from the other, originally from the mother and then the father, but it comes from out there and then it's projected onto some completely non-existent and imaginary force, non-localizable force, but that determines our ability to be free. And as long as we believe in that, then we can't come out of the box. And if we stop believing in, the, in that, then we are pushed into the nothingness because it's that big other ultimately that maintains the fiction of our own existence as entities. So you see how the logic of all of this interlocks to hold us imprisoned in that final box. We cannot attain liberation so long as we believe in these interlocking fantasies. But when you have touched into the supreme self that is not another, it's only in the exoteric realm of religion that God is the other. But no, that's a projection of the same big other. And so that God gives you a whole list of commandments that you can't fulfill and then you feel like a sinner because you haven't done it. And it keeps you entrapped on the same treadmill, whether it's a religious treadmill or it's a, a treadmill of a secular society or of any other belief system, it's the same treadmill. You have to get beyond all belief systems. And then you can discover the real self that is not other and is not the ego self either. So you're not in a solipsistic state. Advaita, non-duality, doesn't mean that I exist as an ego and nobody else does. No. It's that the me does not exist. All that exists, all that is real, is God manifested in the form of beings who have the form they do because they are downloads of archetypal form of beauty that transcends any individual intelligence and are simply signifiers of the cosmic intelligence. That actually is what animates each of us. The same cosmic intelligence. If the sensor within the ego mind will surrender. But it won't surrender without a fight, and that is why there must be a yearning. There must be both a conscious yearning for liberation from our minds having been colonized by this sensor and its ego fantasies. And there must be an alliance created with the superconscious Atman, the real self. And that alliance alone can overpower the ego's commitment to the big other at the human level that holds it trapped in a false identity. And so that's why it's essential in meditation that we silence the ego mind. And in reverence, we invoke silently the presence of the divine love, the divine self, the divine intelligence to fill the emptiness of our awareness with the power of truth and the power of the supreme love of our real being. And if we do that, and if the yearning is genuine and consistent enough, even for only one sitting, we can attain liberation. But it's important to know that whatever thoughts that the ego will send up to try to deviate you from that meditative intensity and one-pointedness are not to be believed not to be entertained, not to be bought into, no matter what those thoughts are. Because God speaks to us in silence. God speaks to us in the energy of divine love. And that will take our awareness to a higher level of intuitive knowing that is being itself. So let's allow ourselves to realize that now.